that's better. For centuries, if not thousands of years, the concept of vampirism has punctuated most of, if not all, cultures and creeds. And while it wouldn't be until the 17th and 18th centuries that the term vampire would actually be coined in Eastern European folklore, the concept of a life-sucking demon or unique member of the undead goes back as far as the latter-day use of Latin. From the earliest examples manifesting as succubus or other demon spawn, through to the latter-day recounting of the life of Vlad the Impaler, the idea of creatures of the night draining the life force of the living in order to preserve their own states while simultaneously enslaving their victims is quite literally a tale as old as time. What modern film audiences would consider vampirism today is a far cry from that of Bram Stoker's original interpretation within the pages of his 1897 novel Dracula. And by 19th century standards, what was written in the pages of that book would best be described as mad ramblings in comparison to the original folk tales. Indeed, it was the culmination of several folk tales involving life sucking demons, the undead, and hypnotic presences that ultimately converged into the modern interpretation of a being of the night that we would commonly refer to as a vampire. And Stoker's novel, while slightly truncating the mythos, was for the time the easiest way to find out exactly what all this vampire malarkey was all about. While it wouldn't be described as a runaway hit critically, the novel was very highly acclaimed, and as a result, with the film industry also on the way up as a respecting art form, it was only a matter of time before Dracula would reach cinema screens in one format or another. While there is speculation about two silent adaptations of Dracula produced in 1920 and 1921 respectively, both of which are lost and both of which are heavily believed to be fabricated due to the lack of any evidence that they actually existed in the first place, today we're going to be dealing with the tangible as we take a look at the unofficial, official, first ever adaptation of Stoker's novel to hit the big screen. Today, we take a look at F. W. Murnau's 1922 German Expressionist masterpiece, Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror. The script takes elements from Stoker's novel, though due to the nature of early silent film production, and a limitation in terms of the scale of the production, original characters were created in order to better smooth out the narrative and elements of the original storyline are minimised or removed altogether. The bulk of the story is told retroactively, through log entries that revolve around our hero of the film, Hutter, and his wife, Ellen. Hutter works for a property seller and developer called Nock, who's currently working for a mysterious and somewhat malevolent Count Orlock, who the log entries describe as the resurrected spawn of the Seed of Bilal. This is just to further emphasise how evil and dangerous this strange character is. Anyway, Nock instructs Hutter to travel to Count Orlock's castle with the aim of selling him a property that is literally across the road from Hutter's place of work. At first he's somewhat hesitant as it is quite a long journey. However, when Nock mentions the very generous paycheck that will come with taking this job on, Hutter agrees, and after leaving his wife in the company of some local friends, he sets off to meet and greet the Count. On the way he stops off to nearby inn for food and bed for the night, and while the locals warn Hutter of the dangers of the Count, Hutter dismisses this until he finds a book in the guest room that describes witchcraft, the occult, and the legend of Nosferatu. Slightly shaken, he travels on, and when he arrives at the outskirts of the castle, he finds a sudden and stark change in atmosphere. He becomes troubled by negative thoughts, and demonic beings guide him to the castle gates, where he's greeted by Count Orlok himself, 
From here, the film takes a stark and frightening turn as Orlok becomes fascinated by Hutter and his pure wife Ellen. He obsesses over blood and blood purity, and it's only when Hutter rereads the extracts on the Guide on Vampires and Nosferatu that he realises he's in the company of pure evil. Hutter attempts to flee, but Orlok attacks him for his blood. Orlok then loads up a cart with several coffins of earth from his burial and takes flight to try and capture Hutter's wife and to relocate to the property Hutter suggested to him in order to be closer to his minions and to have access to more people to sample. He travelled by coach and later by boat to reach the town in a race against time as a weary and injured Hutter desperately tries to get back to his hometown before Count Orlok can destroy it and, more worryingly, capture or end the life of his wife, who appears to be somewhat psychically linked to both Hutter and Orlok. I've withheld some elements of the plot here, in part because to tell them here would really ruin some of the core elements of this film, and in part because some elements of the plot are very convoluted, and trying to explain them here would probably add another three to four pages to this review, and that'd do nothing more than lessen the experience of actually watching the film itself. And in fairness, I think the best way to tackle this film if you haven't seen it before is to go in with as fresh a set of eyes as you possibly can, as it quite literally is the foundation stone of vampire movies from the 1920s right up through to the modern day. This is the film that effectively set the ground rules of what vampires were and were not able to do, and while later adaptations would cling more heavily to the original novel or would tweak the formula to allow for a bit of give to suit the narrative either way, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a film that doesn't use at least one or more of the elements presented in this silent masterpiece. The script itself is split into five acts, and to me, I found it a real mixed bag, honestly. Acts 1 and 2, in which the film is set up, right up to the point where Hutter is attacked by Count Orlok, are zippy, well-paced, and really make use of some fine physical performances. However, Acts 3 and 4 begin to drag a little bit as Orlok travels the long distance back to Hutter's village and his malevolent presence begins to take effect in the areas he travels through. To me, there just isn't enough happening in these acts and I'd have quite happily been okay with these two being edited down and merged into one act that succinctly dealt with just the key points. It's also around this point that the script becomes a little bit messy, as there's a moment where plague rats from Orlok's coffins escape onto the ship that he's on, and later into Hutter's village, killing dozens of people. Though it's never really confirmed whether it is actually plague that's killing the people, or Orlok. Or both. The script seems a little bit hands-off in wanting to say, However, Act 5 sees a bit of a return to form as Hutter arrives back at the village and the final showdown begins. But it's all a little too rushed now, and the ending, while unexpected, was a tiny bit underwhelming. It was only when looking for additional materials about this film that I discovered that I wasn't alone in thinking the pacing was a bit off with this picture and that critics at the time of this film's release also commented that the film was overly long. It could have been trimmed a little bit more conservatively, and that ultimately it was just a bit boring in places. To that end, I also discovered quite how miraculous it was that we were able to watch this film at all, as the script actually caused quite a few issues back in the day. This was written by Henrik Galeen, who had been writing for stage and screen since the very early days of cinema. He's probably best known for writing two of the three movies in the Golem series of films. Here, he's using the novel as a base, but also bringing in some elements of the occult and of Satanism in order to create a somewhat more original and chilling adaptation. How accurate was the occult detailing in this movie? Well, it was double-checked and verified by an actual Satanist, so I'd say pretty damn accurate by all accounts. There was, however, one slight snag with the script. You see, 
Henrik had written it before actually getting any kind of permission from Stoker's estate. And as this film is effectively an adaptation of the book, you can well imagine the estate weren't too happy when they found out that someone was making money from one of their dead relative's finest works. So on its release, they took the entire production company to court on the grounds of copyright infringement. And they won. To that end, it was ruled that all negatives of this film were to be rounded up and destroyed with immediate effect. And had the production company been slower acting, this film may have never seen the light of day again. As it stands, however, we as a species got very lucky, as negatives of the film had already been sent around the world by the time the ruling had been decided. And while the film wasn't particularly well received in its home country, in France the film was an absolute explosive hit with the French surrealists and members of counterculture who took great inspiration from it as they saw it as a great example of the German Expressionist movement that was emerging at the time. To that end, they, along with other countries, went to great lengths to ensure that this film survived the court ruling, making as many copies as possible of the film and hiding as many as possible. Because of this dedication, we actually still retain prints of this film almost a hundred years on. Pacing aside, the script's plot is reasonably well structured in terms of its format, and while I do think it could stand to be about 20 to 30 minutes shorter, for a very first attempt at a visual adaptation of the mythology of a vampire, this is really quite respectable. Of course, with silent films, the script is only as good as the actors performing in it, and here we have some absolutely astounding performances. In particular, Max Schreck as Count Orlok is frankly legendary at this point. He's otherworldly, creepy, and genuinely eerie to watch. Normally, costumes and prosthetics from that era would regularly fail to stand the test of time. But Schreck here? Timeless. It's as strange and brilliant a performance here as it ever would or could be. Though it's also worth mentioning that Gustav von Wangenheim as Hutter is a wonderfully lively and rounded performance as well. He really throws his all into the performance, and his scenes in Orlok's castle, alongside the scenes of him in the final moments of the film, are astoundingly well performed. Direction was handled here by F.W. Murnau. Murnau was a dab hand in theatrical direction before he moved into cinema, having directed numerous productions for the stage before being drafted into service during World War I. While his time on the battlefield was short, he ended up in an internment camp, he spent quite a lot of his time during the latter years of the war directing theatrical productions for his fellow soldiers. At the end of the war, he'd racked up a large amount of stage credits, and it was here that he was able to transition into directing film by utilising his experiences. The direction in Nosferatu is a bit of a mixed bag. While there isn't so much a reliance on delivery from the cast, the placement of the cast members is much more experimental. Given the early nature of this film's existence, I'd be very miserly to criticise the film's direction at a time when, for the most part, everyone was learning the craft on a very basic level. But what I will say is, where the direction works, it's gorgeous and works brilliantly. Shadowy shots of Orlok and scenes of Hutter slowly losing his mind are fantastic examples of the direction working well, and the composition of the cinematography seems almost always to be arranged to draw attention of the eye, which is really what good cine should be doing. However, establishing shots of the ocean are a little underwhelming, and there are some shots that just seem a bit unnecessary, that don't really add much to the overall narrative experience. For the time, it was great. With the benefit of hindsight, it could definitely have been a bit tighter. Nosferatu wasn't Murnau's first film, but it would arguably be his first film of note, and arguably his most successful film. He'd go on to make further productions such as Faust, and probably his second most famous film, Taboo, A Story of the South Seas. Unfortunately, Murnau would die at the age of 42 in a road accident, 
and I feel we'd only begun to see the tip of the iceberg in terms of what he was capable of. One of the other things that I need to touch on, and this was quite popular at the time, was the production of tinted films. This was one of the earliest attempts at colourising film, or at least to guide the audiences as to the time of day, emotion, or presence within the film. Sections of the film would literally be transferred onto coloured film stock and then re-spliced together to create a colour-tinted film. Nosferatu utilises multiple colours to indicate different things. For example, blue-tinted film is used to illustrate nighttime or dark locations. Yellow-tinted film is used to show daytime or firelit, candlelit locations. Pink is used for dawn and dusk. Personally, I'm not all that impressed with film tinting, I'd have rather have seen this in grayscale. It would have been shot in that originally, but if the Masters of Cinema Blu-ray release I own says that the tinted version is the definitive version, I'm not going to argue with that. Aiding the film tinting, it must also be said that the lighting used here is absolutely phenomenal. Black and white film is naturally tipped to favour low and moody lighting. It draws greater emphasis to shadows than colour film stock can, and the grain in black and white film stock is slightly different to colour grain and slightly more prominent. What we see here in Nosferatu is some excellent lighting work that really adds extra menace to Orlok's character. But not only that, it adds a gorgeous shading to locations, like Hutter's home and the inn. It's really quite fantastic. I also can't let a review like this go without talking about the early days of film editing. Here we see some early examples of match cuts and some very rough attempts of in-scene cutting. It's not perfect, it's very rough. Scenes don't just clean cut at the end, they fade in and out. Crossfades are limited more or less exclusively to double exposures, and some of the more complex cuts and edits present in more modern productions are nowhere to be seen. But again, in terms of watching the development of an art form, this is a very early and fascinating example of an integral part of the filmmaking process in live development. And having come from an editing background myself, I found it really quite fascinating. Last but not least, I simply have to mention the score. On its original screening back in 1922, the orchestral score for this film would have been performed live alongside the visuals. They literally would have arranged for an orchestra to attend every screening and perform each time. This score was later recorded and was synced to the picture for this Blu-ray release. It's incredibly atmospheric and spooky, and generally quite unsettling at times, especially with the visuals. The strings are sharp and harsh in places, and it really goes as far as it can go to match the atmosphere of the lighting and performances, and in many regards it's an absolute success. One I would quite happily listen to in its own right. Given my praise for this film, it may come as a surprise that, if I'm being honest, Nosferatu wasn't really for me. I tend to be a bit picky about my silent cinema, and this film wasn't really my cup of tea at all. Don't get me wrong, I can absolutely appreciate the elements that make this film up, and having seen this film three times now, including an actual full-blown cinema screening, I totally understand why this film was a success with Surrealists and the counterculture of the day. It's a sharp and harsh contrast to anything really that was being produced around the time, and it quite literally is responsible for setting the groundwork for multiple experimental and horror-based art pieces. However, I tend to treat the non-comedy silent era of cinema more as an archive and reference experience than I would as something I could actively sit here and critique. The honest answer is that while cinema is constantly evolving and developing as a format, the silent era was a period of literal basic development. And while I can talk about these films from an evolutionary standpoint, and where they sit historically in terms of actually taking them apart and analysing how they work, I find it's quite a laborious process, 
While I can absolutely commend the critics who dedicate their lives to talking about the evolution and interpretation of the silent era, unfortunately it doesn't particularly interest me in that sense. Nosferatu is a film that I'll probably dig out a few more times within my lifetime, but it isn't a film that I would revisit yearly or maybe even once a decade. It's a brilliant reminder to me of where we've come from with cinema as an art form, but I'd be lying if I said that I could sit through this with the same level of enthusiasm as something like Suspiria or one of the Universal Monster movies. I absolutely recommend you go and watch this film at least once. Not only as it's widely considered to be one of the world's first cult films, but as it's very much quite a groundbreaking experience if you appreciate cinema as an art form. This is a pretty essential watch. Just don't expect too much of it, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Nosferatu would travel the globe between 1922 and 1926, and would continue to be shown in cinemas and screenings well into the 1930s. In 1930, however, Universal Studios would acquire the rights to Bram Stoker's novel, and work would begin on a full adaptation of Dracula, in what would effectively launch Universal's horror studios. However, that story is for another time, and in the meantime, we're going to jump ahead a little for the next chapter of this story. <laughs> 